Hey, welcome home. You're watching Legacy Television. I'm Jeremy Pearsons. We are so thankful to have you in the house today. You are always welcome right here in the house of faith. I want us to pray together before we get into the word of God. And I want us to do something together right now. I want us to set our expectation on God and on his word. I'm not expecting anything from you and I don't want you expecting anything from me, but you and I together ought to be fully expecting God to do something in our lives. And what should we expect him to do? We should expect him to watch over his word and perform it in our lives. This is this is the expectation he wants us to put on him. You know, your pressure, you should never be putting pressure on anybody or anything other than the word of God. Father, we come before you today and we come before your word and we believe that we receive from you open eyes and open ears, a heart that sees into your word, a heart and a mind that sees into your plan, your purpose for our lives. And as we come boldly before your word today, we expect to see and to hear and to understand things that change our lives forever. And we thank you, Father, for it. And we give you praise today in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin today on the broadcast something new. And I want to start in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And let's begin reading something here that uh, Paul wrote to a young man in ministry named Timothy. And he said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, he said, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. So you kind of get an idea of where Paul is in his life, in his ministry. He is in the closing days, the winter season, if you will, of his life and ministry. And this is what he has to say about it. Verse 7, he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have kept the faith. You know, the older I get, my perspective matures. And hopefully that's, you know, that's what's supposed to be happening. Our perspective and our opinions about things, it changes and it matures. And the older I get, the more I look at words like this and the more I see somebody who's at that place in their life and the more value I put on that, I, I see these words as precious. And I realize, and you and I both need to recognize this, that not everybody gets to say what Paul just said to Timothy. Not everybody gets to the end of their life, and if they're honest with themselves and honest with God, not everybody gets to say, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now, if people were honest, if they were honest with themselves, and if they were honest with God, they would probably come to the end of their race, come to the end of their life, and they would probably have to say, I, I didn't fight a good fight. I fought poorly. I didn't finish the race. I quit early. I didn't keep the faith. I, I lost it somewhere along the way. Like I said, if people were honest and they took stock and took account of the life that they lived, especially compared to what they were called to do by God himself, they would, most people would have to say, I fought poorly. I quit early. And somewhere along the way, I lost my faith. But I am resolved. <laughs> I am determined. And I want you to make the same determination with me that you and I, even right now, no matter how old or young you are, no matter where you are in the course of your, your race, you are, you've already got the end on your mind right now, praise God. And you are making a decision right now about how it's going to be when you get to the end of this thing. You make a decision right now about the words that you will be able to say and the words you long to hear from Jesus himself. You want to be able to say when you get to the end of this, end of this life, end of this road, you want to be able to say, I fought a good fight. You want to be able to say, I finished the race. And most of all, you want to be able to say this, I kept the faith. And then what do you want to hear? You want to hear from your master, your Lord, your Savior, Jesus, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So you have to make a decision right now. And this is what I mean when I say, you know, you get older a little bit. When you're, when you're young, you don't really think so much about the end. 
You think, you know, I'm, I'm invincible, I'm immortal, I'm young forever. And then one day you look in the mirror and you're like, I don't look like I used to. I don't feel like I used to. And you, you start growing up in the way you think about things. And, and the, the end of a thing, and even though, you know, I say I'm getting older, I'm still a relatively young guy, but my perspective on these things is maturing, as should yours. All of ours should be. And we should be living with the end in mind because that's how God lives. He calls those things that be not as though they were. He declares how the end is going to be from the beginning. This is how faith is. This is how faith lives. You want to get the end of it on your mind. You want to learn. No, I shouldn't say learn. You want to make the determination what you're going to be able to say when you come to the end of this road. Because if you make the determination now, it will affect the way you live and, and what shape you arrive in then. Yeah, I'm talking to, talking to you about the way you live between now and then. I'm determined more so than I ever have been. I am going to say I've fought a good fight. I'm going to be able to stand in the presence of Jesus and say I finished the race. And Jesus, I kept the faith. Let's talk a little bit about these things. And then I, I want to uh, spend some time focused in one specific area. But notice again what he said, I, I fought the good fight. When Paul said, I fought the good fight, it's a reference to the same thing he'd said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6. He said, fight the good fight of faith. I like the Weiss translation of that. It says, be constantly engaged in the contest of faith, which contest is marked by the beauty of its technique. When he said, fight the good fight, he was referring to how you fight the fight. He was referring to the technique that you use when you fight the fight. You know, if you're going to get involved in a fight and actually come out on the other side, the winner, it's going to require some technique. And you've probably heard me say this before, but it bears repeating. Here I am, a 38-year-old man, and somehow I managed to get through high school, teenage years, early 20s. I've never been in a fight. I have never actually been in a real fist-to-fist, hand-to-hand fight. Uh, I've been hit a few times. I, I should mention that. I have been hit a few times, but I don't think it counts as a fight because I never actually hit back. I was always just afraid of being in trouble. So I was the guy that was like, I'm not fighting, I'm not fighting. I don't think I should be proud of this. As, I, as I'm talking about it, I'm realizing this, this is really nothing to be proud of. I did, however, practice fighting, just like... Every young man does. Standing in front of the mirror, you have that imaginary conversation with the guy in the mirror. You know, you talking to me? I don't like your tone. And you know, you throw that imaginary punch and you work on your form and you work on your technique. But I never actually got to use that in an actual fight. And Paul said it like this. He said, thus I fight not as one who beats the air. You know, just beating the air, the problem with that, the problem with me just standing in front of the mirror and, and throwing punches into the air, the problem is you never actually make contact. And if you never make contact, then you'll never make impact. You may have heard me say some of these things before. This has become a real theme for my life in ministry over the last 18 months, pushing two years now. But I am determined in this life that I'm not going to spend it fighting like somebody who beats the air, never making contact, never having impact. I want a life that makes a mark. I want to I wanna lead a ministry that makes a mark on the earth, on the planet that the Lord has put us on and the assignment that he's given to reach people, love people, and minister to people for the love of God and for the love of people. We do what we do. But it's worth nothing if we never make contact with them. And if we never make contact with them, then we can never make an impact on the hearts and the minds and the lives of people all over the world. That's what this is about. But it's going to require some technique. It's got to require this life of faith, this fight of faith. There's got to be some technique to it. It's not you and I just flailing our arms around. It's not us just throwing our arms and, and hoping that we land a punch. That's not technique. This technique is something that we've got to be disciplined in and grow in. And we look to the word and we find out how to live by faith and how to walk by faith. And we develop in that technique. And if we 
will develop in that. Start where you are. Don't pretend you're somewhere else. But this life and this walk of faith, you are where you are. You can't fake being somewhere else. You can't fool God. He sees through it all. So be honest with him. Be honest with yourself. You are where you are. Start there. If you don't start where you actually are, you'll never make progress. But if you'll start right there and begin to develop your technique and your walk and your fight of faith, you'll be able to, at the end of this thing, say, I fought a good fight. There's more that we could say about that, but I really, I want to move on because I want to draw your attention to something else. He went on to say, I have finished the race. I finished the race. You know, finishing the race is very different than starting the race. Anybody can start a race. Do you know I can walk out of this building today when this broadcast is over and I could start a marathon? Now, I couldn't finish one, but I could start one. Oh yeah, I'm a great starter of marathons. (laughs) But it's very different to finish one. There's a big difference between starting something and finishing something. And there's a big difference between finishing something and quitting something. Are you a finisher or are you a quitter? There's a difference between finishing and being finished. I don't want to get halfway through this life, this race, and feel like I'm finished, I'm done, I quit. I'm not, I'm not going halfway across here. I want to come to the end of this thing, and I'm making the determination now, even though the end is decades from here, I'm determining now I'm going to be able to arrive in the presence of Jesus and say, I fought the good fight, and not only did I start the race, I finished it. You want to be able to say, I finished the race. But you know, even more than these, and these things that Paul listed here as he comes to the end of his life, as he comes to the close of his ministry, yes, it's important to say you could, to be able to say you fought the good fight. Yes, it's critical to say you finished the race. But to me, the one that stands out above all, this is what I want to spend our time talking about this week on the broadcast and in the weeks to come. Notice what he said. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. And here it is. I have kept the faith. I kept it. I want to talk to you about being keepers of the faith. That's what this series is going to be called, Keepers of the Faith. You know, I've determined, we're talking about these decisions that we're making, the determinations that we make with our lives and what our life is going to be about and how we live between now and then. And I've determined that I want this to be the summation of my life and ministry. He is and was a keeper of the faith. I'm a keeper of the faith. This is what Paul said. I kept it. I held on to it. I'm a keeper of the faith. What is a keeper of the faith? Somebody who keeps the faith. That's usually a term or an expression we use to describe somebody who holds on to their belief, who maintains their trust, even when it's difficult to do so. And I got to tell you, this is the climate that you and I are living in right now. The culture that we're a part of, the culture that we're in, and even within church culture, even within the family of the body of Christ, there is a pressure and a temptation, if you will, to to let go of some of these things that we've talked about living and walking by faith and, and, and the faith that pleases God, there's constant pressure on you to, to draw back to living by sight, living by what you feel, living by what you see. But I'm declaring, and I invite you to declare the same thing with me. No, I am a keeper of the faith. We'll talk more about this, but back up just a couple of chapters into 2 Timothy chapter 2. I want to connect some dots here. Listen to what he said in verse 21. He said, therefore, uh, we'll back up to verse 20. In a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor, some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful to the master. Useful to the master and prepared for every." good work. You may have heard me mention some of these things before, but a year and a half ago, almost two years ago now, Sarah and I were away together on vacation. 
And I woke up early the first morning of vacation and I, we were in a hotel room there and I walked out to the, the balcony, beautiful scene, looking out over the ocean and the pool and the palm trees. It was wonderful. And I'm sitting there with my Bible. And I had been right here in 2 Timothy chapter 2 studying a couple of days before that trip, but I could tell that the Lord was saying, there's something in there that you need to see that I want you to understand. So I was sitting there on that hotel balcony and looking at this and started looking at, it, looking at it, thinking about it, looking at other translations. And I came across the modern English version of it that says that we can be vessels of, of honor, sanctified and fit for the master's use. And man, that just went off on the inside of me. I don't know if you've ever had scripture explode in you like a bomb, just go off and all of a sudden something that you've maybe heard or even seen before, it's so much more real to you now. It's speaking to you. It's alive. It's become living to you. And I began to hear the voice of the Lord, not out here where you hear it naturally, but on the inside where any believer, born again believer filled with the Holy Spirit can hear the voice of God. I began to hear him say to me, Jeremy, I want you fit by 40. Now, I was 36, almost 37 years old the first time he said that to me. And now, like I said, I'm over 38. So that, that window of time is, is rapidly shrinking. And the assignment he gave me is to be fit, to be useful to him by 40. Put, put a, a deadline, if you will, out there. In other words, Jeremy, something's coming. Something in your life is coming a next phase in your family, your marriage, your ministry. And to be real honest with you, I don't totally know what it is now. I feel like since that time, I begun, began to see glimpses of it. But even now, as I'm talking to you, I don't totally know what it is, but I know it's coming. I know it's coming. Because in God, something is always coming. There's always another step. There's always a new phase. There's always another level. And you need to be asking yourself right now, am I in shape or am I getting in shape? Will I be prepared when the opportunity to step to the next level shows up or will I be stuck out of shape and of no use to the master? See, I've made the decision that I'm going to be ready. I'm going to be prepared. I'm going to be fit for his use. And part of fitness and what I'm discovering as the Lord talks to me about this and as I study it from the word, we think fitness and almost always we think right away about strength. We think about somebody who's developed a lot of strength, can press a lot of weight. But there's another element of fitness that doesn't always stand out to us as much, but I'm telling you, it's just as critical. And it's the element of endurance. Fitness is not just strength. Fitness is strength and endurance. Fitness is not just the ability to lift something heavy or push something big. Fitness is the ability to lift something heavy over a long period of time. See, that's strength and endurance. Endurance is the ability to do something challenging, difficult, maybe even downright hard. And the ability to do it over a long period period of time. And when you apply this to our spiritual fitness, I'll say it to you like this, the longer you can last, the further you can go. The longer you stay with God, the further in God you'll go. The longer you stay with the word, the further the word will take you. This is a part of our spiritual fitness. And when I couple this concept about being fit for the master's use, and you take it and then you fast forward to what Paul said in chapter four, how I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. You know what I see in that more than anything else? This man has endurance to get in a fight and just stay with it and stay with it and stay with it and stay with it. Who wins the fight? I'll tell you who wins the fight. The guy's still standing at the end. That's the one that wins the fight. You know, um, months ago, now, um, it was summer of 2017. I don't know if you remember this or not, but there was a, maybe we've talked about it on the broadcast, but there was a major fight in the United States, a, a prize fight between one, one boxer who was considered by many to be um, the, the pound for pound best boxer in the world ever. And then this other guy 
who has been involved in mixed martial arts and another kind of fighting, he wanted to, um, to get into the ring, if you will, with this boxer. Now, he's never been a proper boxer. He kind of fought a different way, but he said, I want to get in the ring. Well, it was this epic fight. You may remember it. And millions and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars spent on this thing. The guys, both the winner and the loser, walk away with hundreds of millions of dollars. And uh, it was a major thing. They did. They traveled all over the U.S., even different places around the world, hyping this fight. So it was a really big deal. A lot of people watched it. I didn't catch the fight itself, but I did uh, watch some of the interviews afterwards. And sure enough, the guy who was the boxer had been a boxer all his life. He won, but it was in the 10th round. And the, the other fighter lasted a lot longer than everybody thought he would. So I'm watching this interview with this guy. He's an Irish guy. Conor McGregor is his name. And uh, they're interviewing Connor after the fight. And this was right after the fight. I mean, he's still standing there in his fight shorts. He's, he's beat up a bit. And um, there's a guy standing there interviewing him. And he said something in this interview that really caught my attention. He looked at the interviewer and he said, you know, I wasn't overwhelmed by speed. I wasn't overwhelmed by power. I wasn't overwhelmed by his strength. It was his composure. I was overwhelmed by his composure. I love the way he talks. I was overwhelmed, he said, by his composure. Here's the man who just lost a fight to who many consider the best boxer pound for pound in the world ever. He said, you know what? It wasn't his strength that beat me. It wasn't his speed that beat me. It wasn't his power that beat me. It was his composure. What's composure? Composure, for lack of a better way to say it, is just the ability to stick with it. Just staying with it and going round after round after round after round. And it wasn't somebody, he didn't get overwhelmed by speed. He didn't get overwhelmed by power. He didn't get even overwhelmed by strength. He got overwhelmed by this element of fitness called endurance. That's one of the defining characteristics that should define our lives and our walk with the Lord, and yes, our ministry, our family, the ability to endure. You know, the walk of faith is a long walk. It's a long walk. But you want to be able to get to the end of that walk, look Jesus in the eye and say, Jesus, I kept the faith. I didn't lose it. I didn't let anyone or anything talk me out of it pressure me out of it, and I certainly didn't let Satan take it away. I kept the faith. And I'm excited about this series. You and I, we are keepers of the faith. I'm out of time right now, but don't go anywhere. I'll be back in just a moment.
2010, my wife Sarah and I launched Pearson's Ministries International, and shortly after that, she and I began looking for property, buildings, for a place for our ministry to call home. And while we were looking, the Lord began to speak to us. He said, there are things you need to know about your property, and then when you know that, you'll receive it. One of the things he spoke to us in that time years ago was, this property will be a platform from which you reach the nations. And then several years later, I believe it's 2015, the Lord finally led us to this place we're in now. We're in a building that's bought, paid for, debt-free, and we're on a property, though, that's got two other buildings on it. And I believe at the direction of the Lord that 2018, it's time for us to buy up and build out. I don't know if you can see how well you can see out this window behind me, but there's another building back there, a 10,000 square foot building. And I believe it's time to buy that up and build it out. We need television studios and music studios and office space. And this is the time. This is the platform from which we reach the nations. Listen to this from the book of Nehemiah chapter eight. This is um, a time when the word of God was about to be read by Ezra and I want you to see this from chapter eight, verse four. It says, Ezra the scribe stood on a platform. Did you catch that? He stood on a platform of wood, which they had made for the purpose. Now, if you read around it, you find out that the purpose they made this platform for was for the reading, the preaching, and the declaration of the word of God. And that's what this platform is. Some people look at this property and they see big metal buildings. I see a platform from which we reach the nations. We can serve our generation globally with the word of God from this place and teach them how to live by faith in the day of grace. And this is our year to buy up and build out in Jesus' name. So if you want to be a part of this, we invite you to partner with us. There'll be more information about it coming, but I want to extend this opportunity and create an opportunity for you to give and be a part of the building of this platform from which we speak to nations. It's very easy to get involved. If you're inside the United States, the easiest way to get involved is just simply by texting from your phone. You can text LTV and any dollar amount to 28950, or you can give online at pearsonsministries.com, or if you like writing checks, write a check. If you like licking envelopes, lick it, stamp it, and put it in the mail. If you're outside the United States, of course, you can visit us online at pearsonsministries.com. There's safe, quick, easy giving there. Father, in Jesus' name, we receive the giving of the people. We bring it into the work of the ministry, and we declare this is the year we will buy up and build out a platform from which we reach the nations. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, we love you. Thanks for watching today, and we'll see you again next time on Legacy TV.